Let's do a show. Let's do a show right now. What are we doing? Welcome to the future where the glass is half full and you'll need new glasses, where you'll be jumping from conclusions. The past is a and a new future is born. Never before in history has so much meant so little to so many. AD on the radio. So... We are joined on the show today. We are blessed with the presence of award-winning storyteller and Hollywood Generation X Renaissance dude, Sam Firestein. Mm Mm-hmm. That's who's on the show today. And you know what? I don't know. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because we are on the verge of an inauguration of a new president. President Trump will be president of these United States of America and leader of the free world on Friday. And there's so much brouhaha. There's so much speculation. There's so much screaming and yelling going on. Everybody's going one direction. I feel the need. I feel compelled to go the opposite direction. It's like all speculative at this point. And why don't we just settle the hell down and do something else until we have a new president Uh, before it's uh, up until then it's all it's all intellectual it's all just talk there is nothing really for us to dig our hands into at this stage in the game i mean there's certain ha-has and he-he's like vladimir putin saying vladimir putin so unbelievably trump-like in what he said what did he oh what did he say sam do you remember what he said Uh, about what Uh, like he he spoke about the idea of he said, okay, the, the idea that we meddled in the election is fake news, and people who spread fake news are worse than prostitutes. Of course, the prostitutes in Russia are the best. Wait, who said this? The orange gorilla? or No, his Vladimir Putin. Oh, Vladimir, Vladimir Putin. Putin. The, yes, the, the world leader you know slash he, bond victim known as Vladimir out, Putin. He wiped out one of his ex-agents with a radioisotope in London, so... Um, I I think I saw that episode of Conspiracy Theory as well. All Apparently I'm going to say about Vlad is... He's a great guy. He Hi, is Vlad. the strongest man on earth. <laughs> he is the smartest man on earth. We all love him. He is best. He is great. My dad does human rights work in Kosovo and, uh, <laughs> and runs up against... Vladimir Putin's people on a semi-regular basis. I'm like, what's that like? He's like, it's interesting. I think my dad had an interest in international, international legal things, specifically Eastern European stuff from an early age. And I think it came solely from reading too many spy novels as a kid. Like, I genuinely feel like that's why he wanted to go do oil deals in Russia during the Cold War. That's, that's my dad's background. And I think being a corporate oil lawyer and a hippie at the same time are two diametrically opposed things. So now he's kind of doing penance and doing human rights work in former war torn Yugoslavia. And uh, <laughs> like, I, I, I feel like he, it, it, be careful what you wish for, because I feel like my dad grew up reading like John Le Carr spy novels and wish he could live that life. And now he sort of is. And it makes me it makes me nervous when he said like, ah, yeah, I've had a bit of a dust up with Putin's people. That doesn't make me feel good about my dad living. in Kosovo. Wait, 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 wait. <clears throat> Your dad had a dust up. Well, it's just, you know, look, there's uh, in in Eastern Europe, there's and not a dust up, not like fisticuffs, you know, the way lawyers get into dust ups. They have little disagreements. They have, you know, concerns. Our our concerns are this. Your concerns are that. There's a conflict of concerns. We will have to work this out, you know. So it's a weird and tenuous position that he finds himself in. My dad, my favorite story about my dad working in Cold War Russia. And we have an award winning storyteller on the show today. So I'll make this brief so we can get to that. have this dust up uh i think it was well which which one the the experience of doing oil stuff in cold war russia or that was in i I believe he said like the mid 80s and uh and then sort of like his his stuff in kosovo goes back over the last decade and a half he's been living there and, and and doing stuff he's been living in kosovo the last year and a half no no last decade and oh a half. decade and a half oh dear yeah. god yeah he loves it there i was like dad this is, uh, you know, like I'd be concerned, you know, there there would be a bomb go off or, or something, you know, like as happens in former war torn Yugoslavia. And I was like, Dad, this this makes me uncomfortable. Um, 
that worries me. And he's like, living in Kosovo now or any part of this part of the world is just like living in New York in the 70s. There's just streets you don't walk down. I was like, all right then. And he equates it to living in Manhattan in the late 70s. But his story of working... Why is there like killer hip hop in... <laughs> yeah, killer hip hop and the Bronx is on fire, pretty much. <laughs> um, but but his story about doing business in Cold War Russia involves eating a pound of butter. How so? <laughs> Check out this for a tease. We'll do that next. Thank you for hanging out. Fire ants and free thought. All the comforts of what we call home. This is KPRC AM 950. Real Texas. Real talk. Where the left and right come together for fundamental truths. AD on the radio. On Twitter at ADSXE. So it's all theoretical at this point. We don't have a new president yet. We don't know exactly how that's all going to shake out. And people are screaming and yelling and ranting and raving about it. But until it actually happens, I'm sort of taking a break from talking about it. Everybody's going one direction. We are going the other. And uh, for that reason, we have award-winning storyteller on the show today, Sam Firestein, who is going to tell us the, the well, you, you say it so much better than I do, Sam. What's the story involved today? Today's story... Um, how should I put it? What, what I will be presenting to you undeniable evidence that if there is a God, he hates me. No. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) If at the end of my story, Uh I don't hear the words out of you. Dear God, why do you hate Sam? <laughs> I will have failed. You have fa- well, we look forward to hearing that. And uh, I will get to it after after my little story, which I feel obligated to tell, having set it up before. And it involves my father. Uh, yeah, it involves, it involves my father, father doing business. and butter and why he's currently in trauma therapy. <laughs> it involves my dad, butter, and why he's so adept at dealing with Eastern European politics as he does for a living these days. My dad used to do business in, in Cold War Russia. He was a corporate oil lawyer. Now he does human rights work because being a corporate oil lawyer and a hippie are two diametrically opposed things. So I suppose now he's sort of like, it's his penance as a humanitarian for doing what he did for so long. Even though he has nothing but awesome things to say about the oil company he worked for he wound up in a situation in cold war russia and it was interesting not so long ago we were talking about putin and russians and elections and their place on the world stage he's like one thing i know about my dealings with russians is that you know how you have like a conversation with someone like sam you and i could have a conversation what's the point of a conversation just to talk, just to relate, just to hang out. He was like, with the Russians I've dealt with, it doesn't work like that. In every activity, up to and including conversations, there must be a winner. <laughs> like, there is no point in doing anything unless there's a chance of you coming out on top and declaring yourself a victor. Everything from very benign things like going to the grocery store to larger things like, well... <laughs> having an effect on elections as they play out in other parts of the world. But he said that when you went in to deal with the Russians, when you were negotiating with them, when you were doing legal paperwork, there was an intimidation tactic that the Russians had where, well, let me back up a little bit. He's getting ready to go into a meeting. He's getting ready to go into a meeting with a bunch of Russians, and he goes into the bathroom to get ready, as one does, I suppose, when one is a a lawyer in the 1980s. And there he sees his coworker, and my dad's in there sort of like doing what you do before a meeting, combing his hair, getting stuff ready, making sure he won't have to excuse himself to go to the little boy's room. His coworker he sees, is in the midst of eating a half a pound of butter. And he was like, what the hell are you doing that for? 
Turns out, as an intimidation tactic, the Russian counterparts that they're dealing with, every time they reach any kind of an agreement in this legal paperwork as as sort of an attempt to weaken your opponent and as a bit of intimidation, you got to do a shot of vodka. <laughs> so, like... And if you don't do a shot of vodka, you're, you're not a real man and you're not part of the negotiation. And my father was like, I, already, I, I had a decent tolerance. I could take this sort of thing. But my coworker, as it turned out, did not. So he was eating a half a pound of butter to coat his stomach to prevent the alcohol from getting into his system so he could go negotiate with Russians. And I hazard to guess my father's got other stories like that. You ever eaten a pound of butter, Sam? <laughs> do you like gladiator movies? <laughs> <laughs> Oops, I dropped my pencil. <laughs> I am currently Googling, does coating stomach with pound of butter, of butter. Pro, stop. Uh, stop the the effects of alcohol? Does it? Google answers, butter versus alcohol. There are three See? ways alcohol can thing. be metabolized, broken down in your liver, uh, down, uh, but it won't affect your blood level. Eating fatty foods like butter causes your stomach I'm to I'm gaining further... weight just hearing this. Uh, let's so see. wait, is this a legit sure. thing if we, ever have to, uh, if we ever have to negotiate with Russian businessmen that drink vodka as an intimidation tactic? Can we eat butter beforehand to, uh, <laughs> so we can, we can hold our own a little bit better? Does it, does it appear to be true? Was my father's coworker misguided? Um, wait, now Google Google Answers was kind of failing me there. Let's see. Um, this is fun. This, <laughs> yeah. this is this is great. Radio. Welcome to Sam this Google is, stuff. This is. <laughs> <laughs> and the second page in, it's all porn. So okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. I think it basically says like eating fatty foods uh, will cause your body to slow the metabolism of uh, the alcohol uh, in see? advance of uh, binge drinking. So, yes, I could see that. Can you imagine but the after eating- effects, though? Like the next day, having had like seven or eight shots of vodka and eating a pound of butter. Can you imagine what the next morning would be like? I don't on know and how his heart toilet? didn't just rip itself out of his <laughs> chest and burst into flames. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I can't believe we spent a whole segment talking about eating butter and Googling can we re- stuff. Can we redo this? Are, are we going to do, uh, we're going to do Sam's story about conclusive proof that God hates him next, Funkhauser? I yeah. think this segment just proved yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, good. Radio 104.1. Don't get the blues, get all the news. We need all of you guys out there in Radio Land. All aboard! He's back. AD on the radio. Give it up, yeah. Give it up, yeah. Bring this on, bring this on. Come on, come on. Our guest on the show today, award winning storyteller Sam Firestein. Now with a story that he claims is conclusive proof God hates him. Take it away, Sam. It's a Sunday night, 8.30, dead of winter. Pouring, pouring torrential sheets of rain, like huge blankets of rain are pouring down. In fact, a like full slate of just a complete set of linens of weather is just like pouring down <laughs> all over and this is in los angeles i am stopped i am headed westbound on riverside drive stopped at a red light i am driving my parents suv make note of that more on that later and i am (laughs) headed to my apartment but I am not going home. Again, make another mental note. There will be more on that. So I'm stopped at this light. I am waiting for it to turn green. 
There are no other cars in the area, and huge amounts of rain are just like pouring, thundering down on my car, when all of a sudden, BAM! So it is just this crushing, massive force. I am thrown forward. My body snaps up against the seatbelt. My knees crash into the dashboard. My snap back against it. And the car just like lurches forward. And I let out this horrible, horrible wail. Just this. Everything is swirling and spinning in front of me. My neck is just in flames. There's noise. There's, there's. Next thing I know, people are like opening the door and they're talking and I'm hearing these voices, but I can't really hear them. But they're like, be careful, be careful, get them out, get them out, get them out. And I'm dragged out of my car and I'm taken out into the street and I start getting soaked with the rain and focus starts to come slowly. And I see my car. It's, it was it was this I had an SUV. It was a big SUV, but it's just it's accordion. The entire back of it is gone. The windows are shattered out. And, and, and I'm just looking at this thing in a daze and there's, and there's a, a convertible bug like in the street and I see it and somehow it has slammed my giant truck from behind the crosswalk into the middle of an intersection. Other cars go by and they're trying to avoid it and all that is just coming down and I'm, I'm in this like suspended state of shock where it's like I know I'm injured but everything is just, it's, it's like holding just above me from the adrenaline and the shock is keeping it at bay and they take me over to the woman. There's a woman, she's blonde and she's short and she's standing in the middle of the street and they take me to her. And she looks up at me and her eyes are these just dark swirling pools and they don't really focus on me. And she slurs. I wrote down my information. And she's holding up a slip of paper and there's just like squiggly lines on it. And I start screaming at her. How much did you have to drink? How much did you drink? And she just casually looks up at me and goes, there's no need to get rude. (laughs) (laughs) Are you kidding me? Are you freaking to me? Oh, I think there is a huge reason to get rude, you lethal piece of crap drunk (laughs) driver oh oh and arms grab me and people hold me back because they think i'm gonna hit her and i probably would have but i couldn't lift my arm my arm was dangling at my side and then she says to me i've had a bad week (laughs) (laughs) really really (laughs) You've had a bad week. You've had a bad week. Hi. Want to compare? Tell you what. Let's compare bad weeks. And in the end, we'll see who's had a worse week. How about that? Okay. The reason why, look, nobody in Los Angeles leaves the house when it rains. Right? We do not, because it basically means the apocalypse is happening. So why would I be out on the road in such huge, horrible, torrential rains? Why? 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 Hmm. And why would I be going home, driving a car that's not mine, but going to my house, my apartment, but I'm not going home? Hmm. This is all very, very curious. What's going on? Well, I'll tell you what's going on. Four days earlier, while I was home watching team coverage of the rain that was just pouring down and washing away Los Angeles, and I'm serious, it was like the river was overflowing, like trailer parks were getting completely washed away, they had to move homeless people out of their, like, you know... Uh, uh, places along the river because they were drowning, like the flood, like the Sepulveda Basin. A news cameraman actually dove out of a helicopter 
into the water to save a person who was trapped in their car because the Sepulveda Basin was filling up with water and people were almost drowning in their cars. Like, it was massive, massive rains. And it had been being reported for weeks that these rains were coming. It was going to be the worst storm ever seen in Los Angeles. And so I'm sitting at home watching the rain on the television, and I'm also watching the rain pouring down the walls of my apartment and coming down through the light fixtures. Co- coincidentally, coincidentally, <clears throat> my landlord had picked that week to re-roof the apartment building. And they had had, I woke up one morning a day earlier with, with the sound of the, uh, the roof of men ripping the roof off of my apartment building. Now, the thing is, nobody really ever goes ahead and re-roofs a building in the middle of winter, especially when massive torrential rains are being reported for weeks coming up that the worst storm ever. And not only did they remove the roof, they removed the entire roof. Usually, if you have to remove a roof in winter, they do it in little sections little manageable sections this they ripped the entire roof off of the building i called the landlord's office and i said water is pouring in down my walls it's coming out of my light fixtures my landlord wasn't there but the woman who works for him she says well i'm so sorry but i can't call the contractor because i don't speak spanish so i can't talk to him i'm like (laughs) wait 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 you guys ripped off the roof of the building in the middle of winter. And how does this contractor actually have a license? Is this a licensed contractor? Because I would assume he would have to speak the language of the country he's working in to get the license. She hung up on me. And so I'm like, are you kidding? You hung up? You hung up? So I call back, call back, voicemail, voicemail, voicemail. I cannot get them to answer. And I'm just sitting there and I'm watching just rain pouring down and I'm trying to move expensive things or not that I had anything really expensive, but anything that worth something, I tried to move it away from the water, which was hard because there was water everywhere. And about an hour later, it was like my apartment was starting to flood. My neighbor's apartments were starting to flood and there was a bang on my door and I open it and there's a fireman standing there. And he says, one of your neighbors was just electrocuted. We're condemning the building. We're shutting it down. You have 15 minutes to move out. <laughs> Wait, what? What? It turned out, I found out later that the kid who lived below me, there was a, there was a, a young boy and his mom worked below me or lived below me. Uh, He'd come home from school and he'd uh, flip the light switch and he got electrocuted, severely electrocuted. And he called his mom at work and he said, Ma, uh, uh, and he stuttered something out and like passed out on the phone with her. She called 911. The fire department raced over to the building. They got the kid, rushed him to the hospital, and then the fire department took one look at what was going on and they told all of us, don't touch any of the light switches don't touch anything electrical. The building is hot. We're shutting it down. Pack up and leave. I'd been living in this building for three years. I couldn't like just pack up my life in 15 minutes and leave. But that's what I had to do. And I started grabbing things and getting it into my car. Whatever I could that might have some value. And then, and then, where am I supposed to go? Where do we go? What are we supposed to do? So we're now standing on the street calling the apart. Basically, I had to call a lawyer to call my landlord, demanded that he get us because he didn't want to pay for anywhere for the people to stay. He did not want to pay for anywhere for us to, to, to stay. He's like, and I got him on the phone and he goes, I'm, I'm, I'm just as much a victim of this as all of you. And I'm like, no, you're not. We're all soaking wet. All of our stuff is soaking wet. Now, a little thing about uh, my landlord. His name was Jerome Nash. That's his real name. Usually I change names, but this guy was such a dirtbag 
please find him. <laughs> Earlier, our building had been in receivership because Jerome and his mother had been suing each other for control of the building. He, uh, I believe, sued his mother to get all of the properties that they owned together. So he was that kind of guy. I'm not saying his mom was great because she raised him, but still, that's who we're dealing with here. Finally, my lawyer was able to pressure this guy into uh, getting us like a hotels. So there I am. Oh, and uh, on a side note, on just just a side note, a little quinky dink. So let's just look at this. I'm homeless and I'm living in a hotel. And the reason why I am driving my parents' SUV is because seven months earlier, I had been driving my car when a guy came racing up like the middle lane of the road, the one you're, no one's supposed to drive in, and T-boned me and totaled my car. And I had then just spent the last six months with a broken arm, uh, hyperextended neck, sprained back, torn cartilage in my leg. And uh, I had been spent the last six months rehabbing from those injuries. And also what had happened, he was trying to blame me for the accident. It was his fault. So he'd started suing me. And the reason why my car was still sitting there totaled and I had nothing to drive but my parents' car because somebody tried to end my life and then sue me about it. So, just as I was rehabbing and getting ready to go back to work from those injuries, I end up homeless. And then, Diana, you drunk, monster, lethal weapon, (laughs) you hit me. All my injuries are back. They're 10 times worse. My arm is broken again. The tip of my spine where it goes up and it meets your skull is now, it's supposed to be bent backwards like normally. Mine is totally straight. I have to spend the next several weeks like sitting up, uh, sleeping, sitting up because my neck cannot support the weight of my head. I spend another seven months in rehab, trying to recover from these injuries. My eye twitches. I don't remember numbers. I am suffering tremendous trauma and physical trauma and mental and emotional trauma from all these accidents. And on top of all of it. So I look at her and I go, you know what, Diana? Can you top my week? Can you top my week? I'm homeless. I have two totaled cars. I can't work. And I need to go to the hospital. There is one moment that comes to some men in life that no man should ever, ever have to suffer. And there is a universal dream of all Jewish mothers walking this planet. That from the moment their little boy is born and one day leaves the nest, there is one thing that they pray for on a daily basis that no man should ever have to utter these words. And the following morning, I had to call my mother from the hospital. I had two total cars and I was homeless. And I had to tell her, Mom, I'm moving home. <laughs> Sapphire shine, everybody. streets most every day you wait until you get washed away leave the stimulation to the professionals everyone is so smart kbrc more stimulating talk radio Now, more AD on the radio. So, you know, award-winning storyteller Sam Feierstein and I were talking about this a little bit earlier, and I'm going to put it out there on the radio. This world that you work in, and in addition to being in addition to being a storyteller, you're also sort of like this Hollywood guy, man about town, writer, Gen X, Renaissance dude, that you've worked in television and videos and stuff like that. You know how to get stuff done and made and you've been parts of things that we've all watched on the tv over the years right i'm just i'm just a tiny little cog in a giant machine i'm 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 so i'm i'm like an ant 
inconsequential as you may feel. I just, I listen to your shows. I, uh, sorry, I listen to your stories. There I am getting ahead of myself about where this should go. I listen to your stories and I go, this, this, is, this would make great TV. This would be brilliant digital shorts. This is like absolute genius. And, and in a world where content is king, I, I have to imagine that uh, we should be seeing these stories play out on television with you sort of narrating them in a Wonder Years-esque style. I think it would be incredible. A dark, scary wonder years. <laughs> yeah, we've got a great title for it, too. God Hates yeah. Sam. <laughs> God Hates Sam. Tonight on God Hates Sam. <laughs> See? Oh, my gosh. I'm not even going to ask for a point on this when it gets made. When God Hates Sam gets made, you're in the free and clear. Do you think, do you think in any way, shape, or form, there's a possibility that this might be something you wind up doing. And by the way, I'm not asking you to spill your brilliant ideas on the air so other people can steal them. Uh, but like, have inroads been made into this? Because I think it's sort of like crying out to be done. Uh, from your lips to the God who hates me's ears. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, yeah, that would be fantastic. But look, the thing, anytime you turn on your television or go to a movie or or anything, a miracle has taken place, right? That that when you're watching an image up on a screen, the amount of people that have to say yes for uh-huh. something to actually happen, uh, it, it's it's insurmountable odds because you're competing against every other like brilliant, and there are, are, are incredibly talented people all over this town coming up with incredible shows and features and other things. And so many different elements have to conspire together for something to happen mm. that it, it, it is such a, a crapshoot every time. And then you also have to work. You're working against people who are far, far more successful than I am that uh, uh, which would be like everybody that. uh you know, who knows? Uh, but it, it's just like, sure, I would love that. <clears throat> but you, mm-hmm. you have to, even friends of mine who are like hugely successful always have like, you know, 10 irons in the fire and they're always yeah. hoping one will happen because you just, you can't bank on anything. And, you know, something that sounds good, it's, you, you don't know who else has something in the works just like it or what actually sells what 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 is uh, each particular network buying or watching or what does the data say it it's it's um who knows your line of work seems so sort of like exhausting just in that like i know so many people that do similar things to what you do and you're you're working but on it, it's so hard to get anything made you know so hard to get anything made and harder still to get it released and to the point where it's on a screen somewhere and then where it has enough people watching it where it justifies getting it made again and it's like it's it, like you said it's so hard do you find like what's that like because it's it, it, it's i know so many people that have made a career out of this and have never had anything show up on tv or on a screen like they're they've been working for the last 10 years Nothing's ever gotten made, but they've worked consistently just because there's that amount of creativity being flushed down the toilet on a regular basis. But it, I don't know that it's always necessarily being flushed down the toilet. It's just there's only so many outlets, only so much to go around. And mm. again, there's just so many different factors playing into it. And there's there's a lot of negative things that you could say. It's like, oh, the analytics on everything and it dumbs everything down to being it must fall into these extremely tight categories or let's play it safe in this area. But a lot of, you know, bad things come out of that, but a lot of great things come out of that as well. It's just it's just the way it is. Look, and right. any any great and I guess any you're... great career, any great job you're gonna have, like any great career is going to be really hard and have a ton of work uh, to it and be very stressful. Like I have friends who are really successful attorneys. They work insane amounts of hours, right? And they, they, they work in crushing circumstances or <clears throat> friends in finance. It, it just, or, or friends who are doctors. Like it, it's, there's, is there anything that that's ideal or fun and easy that, you know, actually means something? You know, probably not. And I guess, like, for someone like you, if you're a writer, that's part of your process. You know, it's like Stern used to say this all the time when he first started out. He was like, nobody was listening. And boy, am I glad no one was listening because it, you know, as much as we thought we were the greatest things ever, it gave us time to find ourselves and who we are. Like, if you go back and listen to old podcasts of this show from before we were actually being carried by a real radio station, 
it's funny. I did this a lot a while ago. I was like, I like, I like that. That's kind of. It wasn't bad, but I, I realized it was sort of like do it. It. I was in this world where I needed to make money, and I noticed that for a fraction of the ratings, the talk radio people down the hall were driving significantly better cars than me. I'm like, how, how does that work? I guess all you got to do is get on and rant and rave about politics and bazinga. Somebody gives you an S class, and. Um, <clears throat> So I got into talk radio, and I did my best impersonation of a talk radio guy. And I listened. I was like, this is really good, but I'm very glad. I'm very glad people weren't really hearing it at this time because we hadn't sort of like figured out who the hell we are and what the purpose of the show was and but wouldn't it have been a terrible thing to have gotten stuck in that rut where you're doing something that you don't necessarily really believe in just to sort of like sustain the old bank account and it's interesting and i guess for you like all the writing that you do is probably a part of a process that makes you this guy that can now get on the air and tell these incredible captivating stories i remember trent reznor from nine inch nails when he first freed himself uh, freed himself of the shackles of record label weasel oppression he made a song in the studio it was hand that feeds he cranked it out he mixed it uploaded it to the internet and he was like oh that's an incredibly freeing thing. I can just make something and give it to people without people getting their greasy weasel prints all over it. And for you, for the, the, with the amount of work that has to go into it before one of your ideas turns into a thing that people can turn on the TV and watch, I wonder for you if it's such a refreshing thing to just be able to write a story, get up on stage in front of people, and tell it. We'll talk about that with Sam Firestein when we get back. You will never be good enough, you know why? Real Radio. Real Radio. Real Radio. 104.1. There's something happening here, and you should know what it is. <laughs> the dumbing up of America. No, more AD on the radio. So we are joined on the show today by award-winning <laughs> storyteller Sam Firestein, who's also a Hollywood man about town that's been writing and directing and producing and literally everything that one can do to uh, help things come to life and be on a screen where we can watch them. You've been doing for a significant portion of your life. As we were talking about, it's really hard to get stuff made. It's really, really difficult. There's lots of people working on lots of things, some of which never come to fruition. For you, is it a refreshing thing after having spent years doing that to be able to write a story, go on stage, tell it, bazinga, it's it's done? Uh, w- yes, because you get to actually go out and do something and see it through to its end. But it's also that, you know, writing pretty much just takes place in a vacuum all alone in isolation. And so it, it it's... Uh, and people, if they read something to, of yours that they really like, maybe they'll call you afterward. You'll get an email or something. Go, oh, that was great. You know, <laughs> you know, like to get that, like, oh, that was great. You have to have like, you know, hundreds of hours of work. So, right. <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, buddy, that wasn't bad. Click. That was the last year and a half of my life. It, it's it's. Uh, you know, somebody once sent me this like list of like famous writers who killed themselves. <laughs> it's, it's, what, 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 what a buddy old pal of yours to have sent you that list. I think it came in a Valentine and it was just, <laughs> um, and, and it was, it, it, it's extensive. It, and, <laughs> and what you come to realize is, and, and what I tell people is, do you know why so many writers commit suicide? Because they can. Right. <laughs> You know, I think about that's like, really that's like, you know, I've, at least I got this going for me. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Like, I've done it again and I do this over and over again. My, my favorite writer of all time is this dude, P.G. Woodhouse. If you get a chance to read his books, we talked about him on the show over and over again. Please give it a go. It's sort of like a precursor to Seinfeld and, and, you know, no hugging, no learning. You take the least serious things very seriously and things that actually matter are an absolute joke. And it's just a 
it, it's hilarious and amusing. B, this guy's right up there with Shakespeare in his ability to put one word after another and make something beautiful and compelling and entertaining come out. Have you ever read him, Sam? Uh, I have read, I know I've read like a little bit here and there. Uh, uh-huh. And now I'm just trying to Google him to see if he killed himself or died of alcoholism, no. uh, which is <laughs> natural know. causes. He seemed to be he seemed to be pretty jovial about life in general. He sort of seemed to live like one of the characters in his books. But like, here's oh, the weird he thing about that guy. <laughs> yeah, he was also he was like incredibly successful. Like I, people just like, oh, fancy. You're like P.G. Woodhouse, this British writer from like the early 1900s. And it's, it's really not. It's sort of like liking the Seinfeld of his day. He was like the biggest, most ubiquitous humorist. He did everything from writing lyrics to George Gershwin to writing lyrics with George Gershwin to writing articles for popular magazines. And his his work has been adapted eight million times. It's been right. collected into eight bazillion different volume. So what always winds up happening is because he's been around so long, so many of his things are in the public domain, you go on like Kindle or something and there's like 20 free books and they're collected works and some of them the story some of the stories you've read before some of them you haven't and you just wind up rereading over and over again and then you wind up reconsuming his work because there's been a british radio play that was made by the bbc in 1975 that you didn't know about but you discover and it's another wormhole that you go down and i've enjoyed his work over and over again for years and years and years and he's been dead for such a long time and it really speaks to the paradox of a writer that you want to, I think, I think, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Sam, but part of what drives a writer is to reach people, entertain people, touch people's lives, relate to people. Like you're, you're connecting with folks through writing and storytelling. Is, is that not the case? Uh, no, you're, com- you're compelled to do it because you have to do it. Mm-hmm. And and the end result is that uh, you want people to connect with it. Mm. You want it, like, my... like you like you write like you know we read like I think we read to connect, right? We go mm-hmm. to movies to connect. We do those things to connect. But be, you know when you're on the other side, like I read to connect. I read to fall into a book or or uh, go to the movies or television to just lose myself in those and to connect with that. But as I as I'm working it, it's more about like you know what what is the most uh, um, how, how how do I create that like deeply honest place that is compelling? Um, it's a different. It, it comes from like a different end of that. Mm. I'm not. It's I'm thera- not, It's mm. it's therapeutic to you, but it's also sort of a way of connecting with other people. Like I, the purpose is sort I of think, twofold. Yeah, but I think if you if you're if you're deeply on, uh, if you're if you're emotionally honest in in a moment, and it doesn't have to be drama, it can be something that's very funny or very dark and twisted. But if there's if there's a true emotional honesty to it, then uh, people will connect to that. Mm. I, I, but, I think but as as the artist, you have to be really honest in whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah. It's funny you say that uh, you write because you have to. One of my favorite P.G. Woodhouse quotes is, I started writing when I was about six. I don't know what I did before that. Just loafed, I suppose. But the thing that I love about his work is that you can consume it over and over again. The guy's been gone for so long. And I thought, isn't that like God's cruel joke on the writer, the artist, the musician? You have this deep desire to connect. You have this deep desire to affect people's lives. And here it is nine times out of 10, you don't even know that it's happening. You know, you could work a hundred hours on something and get one phone call from a buddy and be like, that wasn't bad. And you probably connected with some other folks. You probably got that end result that you were after, but you just, you don't know about it. You don't feel it. You don't get to reap the reward in a lot of way. And then you get a guy like this that checked out, you know, sort of like years and years ago. And to this day, his work is being enjoyed over and over again. And he knows nothing about it. Like I said, kind of God's cruel prank. God on hates writers. writers. God you, hates you, you specifically, as we've discussed. Ergo. God, <laughs> ergo. Ergo. So, but I mean, like that getting up on stage and storytelling thing, that's got to be a certain amount of instant gratification that, generally speaking, writers are not accustomed to. When it goes really well, when it's great, yeah. when it, when, yeah. when it, when all elements come together, yeah, it, 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 it's the greatest, you know, 10 minutes of your life. And then, <laughs> but, but, but for those 10 minutes to happen, it's, you know, 
100 hours of work. 100 hours of work, if not yeah. more. You know, plus the, the combined effort of all, not just whatever went into that story, but then like just all the work you've been doing that builds to that moment to place you in a position to be able to do that. Hey, you had to have multiple near-death experiences so that you would have stories to tell on this little radio show. Like, you had to get into numerous car accidents. You had to have horrible, awful relationships. You had to have all these terrible slings and arrows that life throws at you so that you could one day, years later, regurgitate them and uh, tell the two listeners that we have. And yeah, I for don't that, imagine, we are like, thankful. <laughs> what, 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 like, I, you know, if somebody had, like, a really great life where everything worked out, Awesome. Like, what would they have to tell? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, there's, have you ever been to, uh, this has had nothing to do with anything, but, um, have you ever I been would to trade Corn- with them for a second in a second. <laughs> you know, that area, uh, Coronado Island oh, yeah. in San Diego, like the, the scene in Anchorman where he's getting ready to off himself. He's on the Coronado bridge. If you go over the Coronado bridge to Coronado Island, it's like a whole, it's a different world. It is beautiful. It is very pricey to live there. There's a large military presence there. You don't really know about it or see it, but you know it's there. And for that reason, it's a patch of land that not a lot of people mess with. You know, it's just, there's something about it. It's safe. It's clean. It's flat. There's no challenging hills to climb in life metaphorically or literally. It's beautiful coastline. You're surrounded by it. It's awesome and incredible. And I go out there sometimes and I think to myself, I, I would love to live out here. This is incredible. And, you know, if one day I have a kid, can you imagine raising them here? And then I go, "Mm, you know, there's nothing to fight against here. There's nothing to push back against here. There's no adverse situation that your children can find. The school district, second to none. Play in your street, no problem. Safe, wonderful, great, nurturing, loving environment for a kid. And I almost feel like it's irresponsible to raise a child in that environment because if you send them out into the world after that, they're going to be completely ill-prepared. <laughs> it's a weird dichotomy. Yep, that's what it is, Sam. A weird dichotomy. Funkhauser, how much time do we have left to kill? <laughs> <laughs> Got another four minutes in you? Oh, yeah, let's do some news. Let's finish uh, up the show with some no, news. No, I can tell you, look, it. I've been to the hell. Uh, is it the Hotel Del Coronado? It's like one of the biggest old. You know what's interesting about the Hotel Del Coronado? It's this massive structure, like a like a small city, all under one roof, is what that place is. And I think it's this wooden hotel that's been there since the dawn of time. And I believe there's not a nail or a screw in it. The whole thing was constructed by just leaning boards together in a way that would interlock them forever. Really? That's what I heard. Yeah, it's, it's like also an architectural they... masterpiece. Oh, that's that's brilliant. I did not know that. It's also where they shot. Um... Some like it hot. Uh huh. <laughs> you guys Tony, know a lot of stuff. Well, I I I, I shot a pilot, uh, and we and we we shot there, and we stayed there years ago. And uh, one of the channels on the television just shows that film like on an endless loop the entire time. And uh, <laughs> but but I remember like being being there and being on the island and looking at it. It was just like the, this is the most perfect Stepford, like yeah. Uh, community i've ever seen this is it's perfect yeah. everybody there is happy it, it, <laughs> yeah. and why wouldn't you be why, it's, uh, why why wouldn't you be happy if you're raised in like such a tranquil beautiful safe surroundings yeah. I, yeah. I mean look i i i i look at friends who've who've raised children in really warm loving houses where it's uh you know it's the same thing where i i just look at their kids like in the house and going like wow they they are just untouched from life and not in a bad way they're not spoiled rats they're just <laughs> no and you want them to be well you see off, how they're like, growing up and you yeah you're kids. just like yeah they're like not only are they wealthy to the point where they don't think about money and it doesn't matter to them and that frees them from the awfulness that money brings but they're also emotionally wealthy as well they're well adjusted like this is this is this is the thing this sums up coronado perfectly beautiful stretches of beach absolutely uh, pristine amazing you you think you're in a different world when you're there forget a different country and what's the one thing what's the one thing that would make a beautiful beach better like you want to go to the beach you want to enjoy everything that it has to offer but you think gee 
I really wish I could bring my dog. Oh, dogs are allowed there. And it's pristine and beautiful because everybody picks up after them. It's like, it's just beyond perfection. Yet it completely would ill prepare you for life in the real world. See, that's why we are in very, very limited circumstances allowed to have nice things. As long as we put it on a (laughs) tiny island. Right. Surround it with military. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And... (laughs) run it with an iron fist and and, yeah. and you know limit the population to like you know 11 teen people yeah but probably yeah. no skateboarding though um no no there's there's sanctioned skateboarding areas and people observe the sanctioned skateboard you can rent all sorts of things to tool around the boardwalk on and you know it, it's just every it's perfect there everybody would want to live there Is it if west they world there I, I, I don't know. I think it's my own personal Truman show. All I know is that whenever I go out there, I understand how Californians happen because all my stresses just disappear as I look at the water. And eventually the words, whatever, man, comes out of my mouth. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's how that's a thing. Thank you so much, award-winning storyteller Sam Firestein. We await your return with quivering anticipation. You rule. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.